everyone. So hello everyone, thanks for the great introduction for this. Um, so um, my name is Patrick Prudhomme, as stated, uh, I will uh, present today on uh, echocardiography and multimodality cardiovascular imaging in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Going to do a, two, a 2022 update because there have been uh, some new guidelines from the uh, American Society of Echocardiography. I have uh, no conflict or, or inter interest or disclosure uh, whatsoever. Now for the objectives uh, of the presentation. For this presentation, I would like uh, uh, you to take home uh, uh, to be able to describe the strength and limitation of echocardiography uh, in imaging uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, uh, to be able to choose alternative or complementary imaging methods in specific settings when evaluating HCM, uh, and it, uh, identifying uh, management changing imaging findings on echocardiography when considering the most uh, recent guidelines. For the presentation sections, I will, I will start off uh, by a, a short introduction just to uh, get everyone up to speed about uh, what is uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and the uh, basic hepatophysiology. Uh, then I will um, I, I will uh, uh, discuss the importance of ADHEM diagnosis and risk stratification using non-invasive non techniques. Uh, and then afterwards, I will uh, uh, talk about the evaluation of confirmed or suspected HCM, and then uh, the risk stratification and prognostication. For the introduction, so uh, now a short primer on uh, HCM and the importance of uh, non-invasive assessment of suspected or confirmed HCM. So what is so important uh, so that we need to talk about the non-invasive assessment of suspected or confirmed HCM? Well, it's a really common uh, disease. Uh, it's the most common genetic abnormality of the myocardium. Uh, it is stated that uh, approximately one over 200 to one over 500 young adults in the US suffered from unexplained left ventricular hypertrophy. So thus that is very frequent diagnosis. So it is a uh, numerical importance and your, the non-invasive assessment of HCM uh, may really help management uh, to decrease uh, such devastating complications such as uh, sudden death, stroke uh, and syncope. Uh, and also it can, uh, the, the accurate uh, assessment of JHCM may help in guiding management and alleviating some of the symptoms of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So it is uh, very important uh, to know uh, basic principles of uh, assessment of HCM using non-invasive uh, techniques. Uh, for this presentation, I will uh, focus on echocardiography because uh, uh, we're in echocardiography rounds, uh, but I will uh, complement some um, uh, um, limitation with the alternative imaging uh, techniques so, uh, so everybody will be up to speed about complementary imaging. So um, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy under the microscope, so what is uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? It's unexplained left ventricular hypertrophy. So you can see uh, at the bottom of the screen uh, uh, on, the, on the image A uh, that there's a symmetric but uh, um, in a very increased hypertrophy, severe co uh, concentric hypertrophy. Uh, this is one of the form, but not the most, uh, uh, most frequent form, but it can be symmetric sometimes. Uh, and then at the right, you can can see that there's a normal heart uh, at image B. And image C and D uh, at the upper images, uh, you, you can see image C is a um, cellular uh, evaluation of uh, HCM. You can see there's uh, myocyte disarray. So it's uh, all anarchic, uh, anarchic structures of the my myocardial cells. And in the image plane, D, uh, you can see a normal heart. So you can see that it's much more than uh, simple hypertrophy. It's also complex uh, myocyte and uh, sarcomeric uh, remodeling uh, that is all guided by uh, mostly genetic abnormalities. Sometimes it, it's difficult to identify some genetic abnormalities, uh, but there are many, uh, and many times there's uh, genetic abnormalities we can identify that are responsible for the uh, myocyte disarray and uh, uh, unexplained hypertrophy. So uh, 
just on some basics about the sarcomere and the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, you can see there's a lot of uh, proteins here. Uh, it's just essential to know at least some of the, of the name of those proteins because uh, they are um, very frequently uh, involved in the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Uh, so you can see um, uh, this is a sarcomere and you can see that there uh, are myosin. Myosin are a protein that uh, grabs on to, uh, um, to actin and um, contract in order to shorten the, the sarcomere. Uh, and uh, uh, in, uh, on the, the protein uh, to, um, to attach uh, those uh, regulatory protein, there are some uh, troponin, uh, tropomyosin, uh, uh, myosin binding proteins. So it all works uh, in order to, uh, uh, for the, the sarcomere to, uh, 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 to, to, uh, to grasp uh, the actin in order to shorten. So any um, mutation of uh, those protein and others can uh, lead to uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Uh, so the most frequent uh, mutation associated with HCM are uh, MYBPC3 and MYH7. Um, there are less. Uh, th there are some mutations that are uh, less frequent, such as a mutation in troponin uh, or um, act actin, uh, but uh, they are rarer. So now, without further ado, let's talk about uh, the evaluation of a suspected or confirmed HCM. Uh, the most uh, basic and important uh, assessment uh, during the evaluation of HCM is left ventricular hypertrophy assessment. Uh, so the severity and localization is very important in evaluating HCM. So you need to do both of these uh, uh, of these tasks to evaluate thoroughly uh, left ventricular hypertrophy in HCM. Uh, it is defined um, that uh, wall thickness of more than or equal to 15 millimeters uh, or 13 millimeters if there's a family history or a known carrier of, of HCM mutation uh, is uh, defines HCM. Uh, in the in absence of other uh, causes of hypertrophy, um, there are some uh, variation with uh, pedi pediatric patients. Uh, we use uh, the Z-score in order to uh, uh, distribute the, the normality of the uh, wall thickness. So it's uh, it's a relative uh, wall thickness in those uh, those population. Um, and there's a direct relationship between, between left ventricular wall thickness and risk of sudden death also. We will get uh, to this more thoroughly at the end of the presentation, but many of the imaging um, uh, aspects of HCM are not only for diagnosis, but also for risk stratification, which means you can predict uh, with echography or the means, uh, the risk of serious complication, and you can intervene before the happens. So that's why it's, it is so important to discuss this uh, thoroughly today. Um, while it can be symmetric, as I said, it's relatively rare that uh, HCM is symmetric. Most of the time, it would be a, of an asymmetric pattern. It is more specific than HCM. Uh, and the most frequent pattern is the sigmoid septum pattern, when, where the enterobasal uh, septum uh, is uh, an enteroseptal uh, basal symptom, symptom is more severe, severely affected. So there are many patterns of hypertrophy in HCM. Uh, there is uh, the sigmoid septum, which is uh, which accounts for approximately 40 to 50 percent of cases. Uh, you can see the image at the far left of the screen. Uh, this form of uh, HCM uh, yields the lowest uh, uh, genetic yield. Um, there is the reverse septal curvature, so uh, the septum. Uh, displays a curvature that is reversed from usual, as the name states. So that accounts for about 30 to 40 percent of, of cases, and it has the highest genetic yield. There's apical uh, cardiomyopathy. Uh, there's also mid-cavity obstruction, with, which is under-recognized, so that's why we don't know exactly uh, the figures. The figures vary a lot because it's relatively rarer and it's under-recognized. And there is the concentric or neutral form of HCM, which has been shown initially with the uh, pathologic uh, images uh, at the beginning of the presentation. So when uh, performing uh, a transthoracic echocardiography, there are some um, um, principles to keep in mind when evaluating LVH in uh, HCM. 
so wall thickness uh, evaluation is more challenging uh, in the apical, interior, and anterolateral walls. Uh, and ultrasound enhancing agents should be considered definitely to uh, better visualize those segment wall when concerned for HCM. So let's say you have a patient that uh, uh, you want to exclude uh, uh, HCM because there's a familial history or uh, uh, because uh, he's a known carrier for mutation causing HCM, then in my opinion, you should uh, uh, use contrast most of the time in, the, in those patients. Uh, for the accurate LV thickness measurement, uh, sometimes there can be a confounding structures uh, uh, at the periphery of uh, the, uh, the septum or other walls. Uh, so uh, it is uh, it is recommended that measurements of the uh, anterior uh, uh, basal septum and other uh, thickened uh, uh, parts of the myocardium be assessed in uh, two different views when feasible. Uh, so you can see on the far uh, on the far left we. Um, uh, we evaluate uh, the um, the uh, we, we exaggerate uh, the um, septum hypertrophy by taking into account part of the right uh, ventricular wall. Uh, and when you go into short axis, it becomes much clearer than there's been exaggeration of the measurements. So in in red, it's the correct measurement, and in blue, it's the the relatively false measurement. So it's essential to uh, image uh, on. Um, orthogonal planes uh, when evaluating for the wall thickness as it is a diagnostic criteria, criteria and it is a prognostic criteria. So if you overestimate it, you may overcall the diagnosis or you may, uh, if uh, close to a risk factor for sudden death, you may uh, overestimate uh, the, the risk of sudden death uh, in those patients. Um, so, so some of the surrounding structures that may be confounding are the RV, uh, sometimes they may uh, be trabeculation or papillary, papillary muscle, depending on where you're measuring the wall thickness. Um, so that's why it's recommended to uh, do multiple imaging plane when evaluating. And sometimes uh, you can use cardiac MRI when it's uh, difficult to assess. Cardiac MRI can measure on um, different uh, different planes, so it can uh, be uh, complementary to the assessment of uh, wall thickness. There is some place in the uh, most recent AEC guideline for 3D uh, echocardiographic measurement. Uh, we, we know that 3D echocardiographic evaluation uh, yields uh, uh, a ventricular mass that is more closely related to CMR than 2D evaluation alone. So that can be considered when evaluating HCM, although I see it uh, relatively rarely in, uh, uh, in my experience, for that indication alone, I mean. Um, so uh, echocardiography has a limited potential in cardiac tissue ca characterization. CMR uh, may help to uh, determine the causes of hypertrophy because there are some uh, uh, enhancement, which is called late gadolinium enhancement with contrast. Uh, which may indicate some region of scarring, and depending on the pattern of scarring, uh, it may yield uh, alternative diagnosis than HCM. Because in HCM, there is the phenomenon which is called phen phenocopies. So these are uh, similes to um, HCM and must be um, differentiated from it. Uh, as I will state in other uh, slides, it is easy, it is. Um, uh, it, it is recommended to uh, uh, take into account the clinical history, uh, the imaging uh, methods, uh, and uh, the, the past medical history of the patient in order to uh, determine uh, if there's a phenocopy involved. And sometimes, uh, depending on the pattern of infiltration, CMR may help in that uh, regard. So just a quick glance at the uh, most recent ACC guidelines in order to uh, better situate the um, the benefits of CMR. So CMR is a, it's a class one indication to perform a cardiac magnetic resonance uh, for patients uh, where uh, echography is inconclusive. Uh, so that's an indication of CMR. Uh, if there's a strong suspicion of alternative diagnosis, such as uh, infiltrative, uh, let's say amyloidosis, for example, athlete's art, uh, CMR uh, is useful, another cl class one. Uh, and for patients who don't have uh, 
other risk factors for um, sudden death uh, and or in which we want to stratify more closely the risk of sudden death and especially if uh, there's difficulty in assessing the uh, left ventricular ejection fraction or LV apical aneurysm for example um, and also we will uh, go to this uh, later on but uh, for patient which uh, in which obstructive HCM uh, there is uh, mitral regurgitation uh, or uh, the mechanism of uh, obstruction is uh, unclear so, so CMR may help in that regard. So this is a, a small chart that I've made just, in, just to illustrate uh, the uh, multiple aspects that you need to uh, think about when evaluating for potential phenocopies. So let's say for example um, uh, you take a hypertensive uh, cardiomyopathy, which may uh, uh, do a symmetric concentric LVH. So, uh, so if you compare it to HM, it's more symmetric. Uh, most likely, patient will have a long a history of long-standing uh, untreated hypertension. And if you perform CMR, uh, they may they, there may be patchy uh, like gadolinium enhancement. So, if you incorporate all of those. Uh, uh, aspect you may uh, it may point more towards hypertensive uh, cardiomyopathy uh, and for example uh, if you take athlete's art I won't go through the, uh, all the the causes today because uh, it's uh, it's a bit too long just to illustrate some per, some um, uh, some concepts but if you take athlete's art the patient will have an increased exercise capacity uh, most likely will be asymptomatic uh, and uh, there uh, may be possibly eccentric and mild hypertrophy and most likely is would be symmetric uh, and uh, there will be an increase in chamber size. Also, they mean be normal uh, systolic function and even supranormal uh, diastolic function. Uh, and usually LGE, so like the other layer management, is uh, absent uh, uh, in those patients. So if, if you incorporate all these imaging findings uh, and the clinical history, you, it may yield a, a clearer diagnosis and exclude hyper um, phenocopies. So that, as I said, uh, if you want to increase the pretest probability uh, while evaluating uh, athlete start versus HCM, well, you have to take into account the number of hours of exercise per week, the duration of training, the age, the MI, the race, because we know uh, Af uh, African American have uh, um, an increase in the left uh, left hypertrophy response to exercise. So that's maybe something to take into account. Uh, the familial history of HCM. So you need to input all those factors uh, and when you do you perform imaging you need to account uh, the ethnicity of the patient because some cutoffs are recommended for black athletes especially uh, compared to a uh, caucasian athlete because uh, it, they, they have a stronger hypertrophic response to exercise so um, Here's a, a, compare, a, um, a chart to compare uh, athlete's art and HCM. Uh, so you see uh, LVH uh, will be symmetric in athlete's art and asymmetric in HCM. Uh, the LV size will be increased in athlete's art. Um, usually LVOT obstruction is absent in athlete's art. Uh, diastolic function will be reduced in HCM and not in athlete's art. The chamber size will be mildly increased. Uh, the functional capacity in HCM will be normal or low compared to athlete's heart. Uh, there may be some impact of the training on LVH. If you uh, recommend the, to the patient to stop exercising altogether, uh, the LVH may improve when there are some difficult cases uh, to distinguish between athlete's heart and HCM. Uh, and uh, we also stated that uh, LG is uh, uh, unfrequent uh, in athlete's heart, but may rarely occur uh, over the point of RV insertion. So the evaluation of left ventricular systolic function. Um, so uh, the majority of patients with HCM will have a, a LVEF that is uh, uh, normal to hyperdynamic, most likely hyperdynamic. Uh, uh, LVEF uh, lower to uh, than 50% um, is an anonymous prognostic sign with increased rates of all-cause mortality, advanced cardiac support, or transplantation. So it's it's very important in those cases where you're not exactly sure whether the patient has low normal or normal it's uh, very important to use ultrasound and enhancing agent because it may, it may mean life or death in those patients so uh, those will be the most important patient for my opinion to use uh, ultrasound enhancing agents because even 50 percent of EF 
uh, you can see increased risk of sudden death. So uh, very important to determine with precision. And CMR can be used when uh, LVF evaluation is uh, uh, inconclusive or uh, when, it, when it is difficult uh, echocardiographic windows. And uh, most of the time, CT scan may be used, but uh, only if there's a contraindication to CMR. Uh, there is some indication that uh, uh, left ventricular systolic strain may be in helpful in determining the left ventricular hypertrophy pattern because it seems uh, that uh, decreased left ventricular systolic strain occurs over uh, parts of the myocardium which are uh, hypertrophied. Uh, so it may correlate with patterns uh, when it, it is more difficult to determine uh, which areas are hypertrophied or not. And the variation with exercise of strain may be associated with adverse events. So uh, when we perform uh, exercise echocardiography, it's rare that we perform strain, but <clears throat> there is some notion that uh, if failure to increase global longitudinal strain with exercise is an ominous uh, prognostic sign. So now for the evaluation of diastolic function. So echocardiography is the only widely available method, uh, non-invasive method, I should say, of evaluating diastolic function in HCM. Increased stiffness and increased myocyte number, decreased LV relaxation and left atrium myopathy uh, may contribute to diastolic dysfunction in, CMA, uh, in HCM. <clears throat> uh, abdermal di diastolic function correlates with higher left ventricular filling pressure during evasive study. Uh, so it, uh, the non-invasive assessment is reliable when considering the gold standard of invasive uh, assessment. And we know that uh, if there's a restrictive pattern in diastolic function, uh, yields prognostic information because there's <clears throat> increased hospitalization, decreased functional capacity, and increased sudden death in those patients. So basically, the evaluation of diastolic function in HCM is very similar to uh, our um, usual pattern recommended by the ASC. So I won't go uh, into too much detail but you have to take into account the left atrial volume index, the E over E prime ratio, and the peak TR velocity, uh, very similarly to what we do in the uh, inpatient uh, without HCM. Um, there's notion that peak TR velocity and pulmonary vein atrial filling pressure are more reliable when there's uh, moderate uh, mitral regurgitation or more because you know it it may happen with uh, uh, systolic anterior motion of the end at the uh, anterior leaflet that there's uh, mitral regurgitation so these parameters are more useful into evaluating diastolic uh, function so another uh, important aspect of uh, evaluation of hcm is uh, the evaluation of lvot obstruction and mitral anatomy uh, just to uh, put into perspective with the recent uh, uh, ACC guidelines. Uh, so when, um, it, it just to show you that determining if there's a significant LVOT obstruction is paramount to determining what is the optimal treatment because uh, all the uh, indication for treatment uh, or most, I, I should say, are based whether they're, the patient has LVOT obstruction. So uh, when patients are symptomatic and have LVOT, um, it, is, uh, it is then that you may uh, consider the surgical treatment, but only if uh, uh, LVOT meets uh, certain uh, criteria. Um, so, and if uh, patients are symptomatic, we will get to, uh, to this uh, later on in the presentation. Um, so, uh, Evaluation of dynamic LVO2 obstruction and mitral anatomy. So um, a third of uh, patients are obstructive at rest, which means that they have a, a significant resting intraventricular gradient. Uh, a third are latent or provoked with maneuvers such as Valsalva. Uh, there are other maneuvers uh, which may provoke LVO2 gradient. And a third are, are non-obstructive. Um, resting intraventricular gradient of uh, more uh, of 30 uh, millimeters of mercury or more are associated with an increase of uh, sudden cardiac death. So that's very important to de determine with precision. And resting or provoked gradient of more to or uh, equal to uh, 50 millimeters of mercury are a threshold for invasive septal reduction therapies uh, when symptoms are drug refractory. So when you have those gradients and a symptomatic, symptomatic patient, you should start uh, by uh, using therapies such as beta blockers, calcium uh, channel blockers, or diso 
pyramid. Uh, and then afterwards, you should consider the, to uh, perform invasive cell tall reduction therapy. Uh, so for the evaluation of dynamic, dynamic LVOT obstruction and mitral anatomy, so uh, many contributors uh, to dynamic LVOT obstruction, there's uh, anatomic substrate, which means that in HCM, it's not only the venturi effect in the LVOT uh, that triggers the um, uh, LVOT uh, obstruction, it's uh, most, mostly the anatomic abnormality of the mitral valve. So the anterior mitral valve leaflet is usually in HCM longer than the posterior and more anteriorly displaced. So the tips, uh, the tip of the anterior uh, valve, uh, mitral valve leaflet protrudes in the uh, LVOT. Uh, so it gets caught up more easily in the LVOT jet. So that predisposes some patient to have uh, uh, obstruction uh, during the anterior movement of the uh, mitral valve. Um, and the, the mitral valve leaflets are usually elongated and the coaptation is more at the body of the leaflet. So there, are so there is some redundancy of the tip of the leaflet, which may get caught, or caught up more easily in the LVOT chamber. Um, and uh, the cordae are so more uh, of an, of an increased laxity, so that increases the risk of LVOT obstruction. There are many uh, papillary muscle variants and the importance of uh, noting them uh, on uh, echocardiography and cardiovascular imaging are uh, mostly to help surgical planning, but also to determine uh, mechanism of the uh, mitral valve regurgitation uh, and or the LVOT obstruction. Uh, so the most frequent uh, papillary muscle variants are bifid papillary muscle, 70% uh, of patient uh, uh, which uh, uh, HCM uh, will have uh, some abnormalities on CMR. Uh, an anomalous papillary muscle insertion uh, that are directed more anteriorly occurs relatively frequently in 13% of cases, which may contribute to uh, the LVOT obstruction. Also, hypertrophy of papillary muscle. Uh, hypermobile papillary muscles and presence of accessory cords, uh, especially to the A2 scallop, are a frequent uh, mitral uh, valve anatomy anomalies in HCM. Uh, so as I said, because um, the outflow track is narrow, is narrowed in uh, HCM. Uh, there's an increased velocity contributing to drag force, but that alone is not sufficient to explain uh, LVOT. The main explanation is uh, an increased mitral valve area and uh, the localization of the uh, leaflet tips and coaptation point. Uh, that means uh, that the mitral valve leaflet gets caught up in the, uh, um, in the drag forces in the LVOT, which uh, protrudes the mitral valve leaflets in the uh, LVOT and uh, contributes to dynamic LVOT obstruction. So you can see some of the anomalies I've spoken to you earlier. Uh, so you can see uh, at the left uh, of the screen that there's uh, anterior displacement of the papillary muscle. The papillary muscle is much more anteriorly uh, positioned. So you can see that it gets caught up in the LVOT uh, jet. Uh, and there's also there may be also a bifid papillary muscle so at the right of the screen so because of their cons uh, of their localization uh, they're especially prone to obstructing the LVOT emptying during systole and to contri contribute to LVOT obstruction. So when you see LVOT obstruction, uh, doesn't mean that there's necessarily HCM, uh, doesn't mean that there's necessarily SAM. Uh, so you have to take into account many other clinical scenarios. So there's a wide the differential diagnosis. diagnosis. Um, so you can have an LRD patient with hypertension and uh, uh, sigmoid symptoms. So sometimes you see, can see people uh, that are elderly have a uh, hypertrophy, the uh, sigmoid symptom that is not necessarily due to uh, HCM and most likely due to aging. So when those patients are hyperdynamic for let's say anemia, for example, or other states, uh, it may obstruct the LVOT, LVOT tract. Um, if you have acute myocardial infarction, sometimes the basal septal hypercontractility may obstruct the LVOT. They can all be, uh, also be the same phenomenon with tak Takotsubo cardiomyopathy uh, and there are so on and so on. So you just have to take into the account uh, that other factors may uh, render the patient uh, hyperdynamic and 
because of the baseline anatomy of the patient, usually small ventricle or a slightly asymmetric ventricle, it may lead to LVOT obstruction, and that's not necessarily the synonym of HCM. Uh, so echocardiographic techniques of evaluation of LVOT obstruction. So there are many techniques. Uh, you, um, we don't use this. Uh, well, we, we may use the M mode uh, to quantify the severity of systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve. Uh, and it's mainly de de determined by the SAM uh, septal distance. So the distance between the anterior valve uh, leaflet and the septum. So you would characterize uh, a SAM uh, being mild uh, when the SAM uh, is to septal distance is more than 10 millimeters. If it is less uh, or equal to 10 millimeters, it will be called moderate, especially if the contact is less than 30% of systole. And it would be called as severe if the prolonged SAM septal contact lasts at least 30% of systole. So here you can see uh, the, the SAM phenomenon, so the systolic anterior motion of the mit mitral valve leaflet uh, on M mode. So you can uh, see that you can measure the distance between the septum uh, and the anterior valve uh, leaflet. And there it is, uh, it is touching, seems to be uh, a, a bit uh, close to 30%, so I would call this moderate. Uh, and there, are, there may be also mid systolic notch of the aortic valve, with, uh, which may be associated also. Um, so to localize the site of the obstruction, it is recommended to use uh, the color doppler first. Uh, so you can see the site of turbulence where there, where there's aliasing, and then afterwards you may guide the pulse wave doppler from apex to uh, LVOT and localize where the uh, increased velocity uh, come from exactly. Uh, so there may be two patterns as illustrated here of the uh, Doppler LVO3 track obstruction. Uh, there may be the uh, low velocity at the body of the LV, which is relatively symmetric but late peaking. Uh, and when it is severe enough, there can be an ab abrupt decrease in velocity when the uh, left ventricular cavity obliterates and it does uh, what we call a lobster claw abnormality. So a dip at the middle of the uh, uh, Doppler uh, tracing. Uh, so that's a sign that the left ventricular cavity is uh, collapsing on itself and then in increasing in volume again to let uh, the rest of the uh, the blood uh, flow through the LVOT. Uh, so when we measure the, LV, uh, the LVOT, the intraventricular gradient, um, we uh, you must uh, see the pattern because it may be confounded as we will talk a bit later on uh, with mitral regurgitation and we can use the uh, CW Doppler and the Bernoulli, uh, the simplified Bernoulli equa equation in order to, calc uh, to calculate the LVOT gradient so uh, four times LVOT velocity uh, square. Um, T has a limited uh, place in evaluating uh, HTM. Um, T is recommended, especially when there's poor acoustic windows, difficulty establishing uh, the etiology of LVOT obstruction and determining mitral valve and valvular apparatus abnormalities and mechanism of mitral regurgitation. Uh, there may be some challenges in evaluating LVOT obstruction, such as mitral regurgitation jet as the confounding Doppler signal, subvalvular stenosis, hyperdynamic LV function, or concomitant aortic stenosis, which pose, poses challenge. So you can see here, uh, there's uh, LVOT uh, track obstruction on the left and on the right, uh, it's LVOT track obstruction with uh, superimposed MR velocity. Uh, so it may be difficult to tell apart. So what we recommend uh, in uh, de determining which is which is to sweep the CW Doppler progressively towards the MR jet, and that may help into distinguishing it from LVOT track obstruction. Um, <clears throat> the velocities uh, that are more than 5.5 millimeters uh, per second may suggest MR rather than LVOT obstruction when the shape is homogeneous. Um, MR usually peaks earlier than the LVOT track obstruction, and the difference between peak gradient from uh, LVOT and MR should approximate SBP. So that may be a useful method into determining what is the actual LVOT gradient when you know the two. And you may use alternative views such as right parasternal views. So here's a small method that you may use in order to, uh, to determine the LVOT gradient. You may, uh, um, you may subtract the systolic blood pressure from the LV systolic pressure. Uh, which uh, equals to the LVOT gradient. 
uh, so that may be of use in uh, determining the uh, the amount of the LVOT track obstruction. Sometimes there may be subtle subvalvular aortic stenosis, which are congenital abnormalities where the, there is decrease in the valvular area because of uh, an obstruction uh, beneath the valve. Uh, so the Doppler signal usually peaks uh, earlier than the uh, uh, LVOT tract obstruction that is caused by HCM. Aortic regurgitation can be uh, uh, associated with this anomaly. Uh, so that's, uh, that increases the likelihood of subvalvular aortic stenosis. T may be of use in that uh, specific setting when it's not clear if there's a ridge on TT uh, and the in the LVOT. Uh, and the absence of SAM decreases the likelihood of HCM. Um, when comparing HCM to hyperdynamic LV function, all the uh, clinical setting that I've talked to earlier, uh, usually uh, LVOT obstruction uh, are uh, peak uh, relatively later. The level of the obstruction is at the mid cavity level. You can see that there's a clear cavity obliteration uh, in systole, and usually there's the absence of asymmetric hypertrophy, except in settings I've talked to earlier. Uh, and there's also the clinical context, for example, ICU, uh, sepsis, and things like that, increase of um, uh, inotropes, uh, and all those things. Uh, another challenge when evaluating LVOT obstruction uh, is uh, concomitant aortic stenosis. So um, when you evaluate uh, this, um, this uh, specific clinical setting, you need to first inspect the, the valve. So you need to inspect the valve thickness for uh, the valve for thickness or calcification uh, and restriction in leaflet motion. Uh, there, you can also use the color Doppler to identify the level of turbulence, whether it is coming from uh, the uh, LV or uh, near the aortic valve. Um, usually the peak of uh, CW Doppler is earlier in AS than dynamic LVOT track obstruction, although uh, in severe AS it may come later. Uh, the, cha the shape is more homogeneous in AS than dynamic LVOT track obstruction, so that's another sign. Uh, and it is stated that continuity equation is not recommended to calculate valve area in those settings. Um, there is a formula that was mentioned in the AC guideline, so you may, uh, if there's concomitant aortic stenosis, um, do a subtraction between the um, aorta velocities and the uh, LVOT velocities and uh, put them over square and multiply them by four, such as the Bernoulli equation, uh, to determine uh, the uh, LVOT, uh, the aortic valve gradient. Such in that setting, so you would see here the uh, uh, the velocity in the uh, R for the aortic valve is 3.9 meters per second, uh, and for the LVOT gradient it's 2.8. Uh, so in the guideline, they suggest that you can input those uh, values into the formula I just explained to you and determine uh, the aortic valve gradient. So provoking the LVOT gradient, uh, LVOT is dynamic, LVOT obstruction is dynamic and increased by loading condition, can even be influenced by a post prandial state. Um, usually we use the Valsava maneuver because it is easy uh, uh, to, to perform. Um, for other patients which who don't understand uh, the um, how to do a Valsava because it can happen. Sometimes blowing in a, sir in a syringe uh, without the, the needle is uh, maybe a helpful maneuver for uh, more than 10 seconds. Also, even when patients are able to, uh, to mobilize, we, you can do a, a squat for three seconds and then stand uh, times five, uh, five, five, four, five times. Uh, in order to elicit uh, the LVOT gradient obstruction. And uh, there's also a theor theoretical uh, inhalation of amyl nitrate, which may be done, but uh, is rarely done in clinical practice. Uh, exercise echocardiography is uh, the most physiological way to induce gradients. It is important because even triggered LVOT gradient are inf uh, inform about uh, the prognosis of the patient and uh, uh, are useful into a guiding management uh, for uh, starting uh, medication, for example, or considering patient for LVOT, uh, well, for septal reduction therapies. Uh, upright exercise is the most physiologic, but induce, it, it, it induces higher gradient because there's pooling in the lower limbs, for example, and there's the increase in the post uh, uh, in a, a post loading condition. Um, the vitamin stress is not uh, recommended as it may induce gradient even in normal patients. 
Um, although it is uh, preferred to do upright exercises, uh, measurement in the supine position may be easier sometimes. And it is important to state also if the sole purpose of the exercise echocardiography is to monitor for the increased LVOT gradient and the patient is already on beta blocker, uh, you should not discontinue the beta blocker for the sole purpose of this test because uh, all the indications for surgery are refractory symptoms and increased gradient when the uh, medical therapy is optimal. So you should uh, pursue those unless there you want to exclude uh, um, that there are um, that there is CAD. So this is uh, only to um, to state the importance of uh, stress uh, echocardiography uh, in evaluating LVOT gradient. It's a class one indication with the ACC 2020 guidelines uh, to perform uh, patient uh, to perform stress exercise echocardiography in patients uh, who. Um, uh, who do not have a resting or provocable outflow gradient, uh, as it may guide management. Um, and you can also um, perform uh, exercise uh, stress tests with uh, a measurement of VO2 max uh, in order to uh, qualify those patients who may be eligible for further advanced therapies. Uh, so mitral regurgitation in HCM, not all MR in HCM are related to systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve. Uh, they may be related to the mismatch of anterior and posterior leaflet as stated earlier. Uh, the MR jet is most often posterior and lateral in SAM and HCM. So a central or anterior jet should increase the suspicion for intrinsic mitral valve disease. And because the MR jet is so often eccentric, quantification may be done using CMR uh, and volumetric assessment. Uh, there's another case of, um, uh, that as I've told you earlier, there may be mid-ventricular obstruction and apical aneurysm. So it's relatively rare that the obstruction is at the mid-ventricular level uh, as it occurs more frequently towards the LVOT usually. Uh, the criteria are systolic obliteration of the LV and systolic pressure uh, increase of more than 30 millimeters of mercury in systole at the mid-cavity level. And the anatomic substrates are uh, hypertrophied mid-wall, hypertrophied papillary muscles, hyperdynamic free wall, and apical aneurysm. So uh, the mid-ventricular uh, obstruction, what we would find on the Doppler is uh, a CW Doppler jet with uh, velocities peaking in mid-systole with abrupt decrease. Uh, they may be also paradoxical Doppler jet from the apex in diastole, possible due to the possibly due to the incomplete emptying. So there there may be a diastolic gradient in those patients. And when it's not, it's difficult to image the apex. For, for example, if there's apical foreshortening or a, a worry about uh, apical aneurysm, um, CMR with uh, gadolinium injection may reveal. Um, May may indicate uh, that there are some there is some apical um, aneurysm or uh, uh, apical thrombosis, so it may be also useful to perform this. So the last uh, section is relatively short because I've uh, I've touched uh, that subject uh, all throughout my presentation, but I'll just redo a, uh, I'll do a recap uh, in this section. So the role of echocardiography in risk prediction. So risk stratification and imaging, there are some factors that are re relatively more important than others in uh, predicting sudden death and complications uh, in HCM. So if there's wall thickness that is more two or equal than uh, 30 millimeters, uh, that increases the risk. If uh, the risk also increases linearly with the LA diameter uh, uh, in anterior posterior measurements. Uh, LVOT obstruction uh, gradient more than uh, 90 millimeters of mercury also, uh, if there's an apical aneurysm, uh, if uh, there's scarring of more than 50% of the myocardium, uh, or if the LVF is 50% or less, uh, that all increases the risk of sudden death. So these studies are, are um, there, there have been many studies uh, that uh, confirm those uh, those numbers. So this is uh, a study uh, which uh, correlated the incidence of sudden deaths over uh, over five years in patients with uh, <clears throat> increased uh, left ventricular wall thickness in HCM. So that's the New England Journal of Medicine in uh, 2000. Uh, you can see that there's a, a linear increase in uh, the risk of sudden death with the increase of uh, a maximal left ventricular wall thickness. So that's why it's so important to determine with precision because it may 
guide, directly guide management, directly guide uh, defibrillator implantation, for example. So it's very important to have a precise assessment of the uh, maximal left ventricular wall thickness. Uh, for the LVOT obstruction, that's another very important metric to uh, to obtain during the uh, echocardiography assessment, because you can see that a patient with uh, that is asymptomatic with obstruction will die more over the years, uh, or have more heart failure or more stroke than a patient with no obstruction, uh, as uh, it is an important risk factor for uh, those complications. Uh, you can see the risk start to increase after four to five years and uh, continue to increase up to 10 years. So that's that's why it's a very important metric to measure with precision. And the uh, apical aneurysm, well, it's um, there. We, we don't have access to uh, wide, uh, widely um, uh, with great uh, numbers of studies, but uh, some small uh, cohort uh, uh, series studies have shown that uh, there are there have been many adverse events uh, associated with apical aneurysm. Uh, for example, uh, this is uh, from um, uh, uh, an article in the uh, circulation uh, paper, uh, which has shown that uh, 28 patients with HCM and uh, apical aneurysm uh, of the 28 patients uh, in a follow-up uh, over uh, over five years, uh, there's uh, 12 that experience adverse events, such as two that occurs with sudden death, uh, two with aborted ca cardiac arrest, uh, progressive heart failure and death in five, uh, and with inpatient who have uh, ICD implanted, there have been appropriate ICD discharge also. So it's not a benign finding to say the least. Um, so just uh, as uh, to, to input a bit the perspective of echocardiography in uh, risk stratification, you can see that when evaluating for risk stratification, you take into, into account the history of the cardiac arrest, history of uh, syncope, uh, familial history, and uh, maximal LV thickness, EF, LV apical aneurysm, uh, and there's also uh, wall thickness. Um, there's also uh, apical aneurysm, LGE on CMR, CMR imaging. So all uh, the factors I've spoke to you before are in the ACC 2020 guideline. So in conclusion, uh, echocardiography is the main di diagnostic method in HCM at is, at it, as it is widely available. Uh, physiologic evaluation of HCM with echocardiography is the mainstay in guiding therapy. Uh, most of the morphologic information is acquired with echocardiography. CMR may be especially useful in assessing the uh, presence of apical aneurysm and tissue characterization for fibrosis and risk assessment. Thank you for listening, and I will be taking questions if there are any. Thank you very much, Patrick. I'm going to turn the recording off.